Review time is the home for all things theme parks. Stay up to date with our videos by subscribing and tapping the bell icon. The first things that come to mind when you think of Six Flags are probably massive roller coasters, thrilling flat rides, and interesting yearly videos featuring Jim Reed Anderson. But in the 1980s, Six Flags would tackle something completely out of their comfort zone. Something which was, according to them, not a theme park. And an entertainment project they insisted would contain no rides. The Six Flags power plant was home to a number of elaborate shows and walkthrough attractions designed by some of the most creative minds in the industry. But a lack of planning, advertising and understanding by the everyday guest would see it not even survive five years of operation, and today is almost completely unknown in the theme park community. For review time, I'm Luke, and this is the history of the Six Flags Power Plant, the Six Flags Park with no rides. Originally opening in 1909, the Pratt Street Power Plant in downtown Baltimore served as the major power source for the United Railways and Electric Company, who powered the city's streetcars, before being returned to service for the World War II production demand and finally being retired as a power plant in 1973. The power plant would then sit abandoned for over 10 years, until a development proposal from Six Flags was approved by the city of Baltimore, allowing them a lease on the property. Six Flags had decided they wanted to be in the urban entertainment center business, a business Disney would later attempt to break into with Disney Quest. And the Pratt Street power plant seemed like the perfect location to help Six Flags diversify their business model, already seeing around 12 million annual guests a year to the future site's vicinity. Six Flags brought aboard a ragtag bunch of huge names in the themed entertainment industry, including famed Imagineers such as Mark Davis and Herb Ryman, in a team led by Gary Goddard as head of design. Goddard was a former Imagineer who decided to branch out, first working for Landmark Entertainment on projects such as Monster Plantation for Six Flags Over Georgia and the Power Plant, before eventually creating his own company, which would design many much-loved attractions all around the world. Six Flags contracted the Landmark Entertainment Group to develop the power plant, insisting that every step of the way, no rides be included in the project, no matter how many people like Gary Goddard push back at this decision. The project brought together an incredible team of talented minds from artists to programmers to designers who would all work together to hopefully create something incredible, even with the imposed restrictions. But problems for the park arose from the very beginning of the planning process. Even though Six Flags had assembled an amazing team of creatives capable of delivering a spectacular final product, their insistence on certain things and mismanagement of the project set it on a path to failure before it had even opened. One of the biggest pre-opening problems was the marketing of the project. Six Flags decided to emblazon the side of the building with a massive banner that said, not an amusement park, in large, bold letters. Immediately, the creative team approached the marketing company in charge of the decision, who said it was the start of their campaign, which would have continued with banners such as, not a museum, not a theme park, etc. The problem with this was that it simply told potential visitors what it wasn't, not what it was. So Six Flags cancelled the campaign, but left up the Not an Amusement Park banner for months before the park opened, leaving the only official marketing message from Six Flags being that it definitely was not an amusement park. Eventually, the project was complete with every designer and company giving their absolute all to the project, even with the strict guidelines. The park opened in the summer of 1985 at a total cost of around 40 million US dollars, and featured a stark, colorless building exterior due to, unsurprisingly, Six Flags budgetary reasons, as well as, you guessed it, exactly zero rides within. The power plant facility was owned by the character Professor T. Flag, and was a place where he stored, invented, collected and created wonders never before seen. So let's take a step inside and see what awaited guests if it wasn't rides. 
Entering the Six Flags power plant, you were greeted by a grand entrance hall. Overhead was a collection of flying machines, and atop a pillar was a statue of Professor Phineas T. Flagg himself, who was a combination of Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, and P.T. Barnum, and an all-around eclectic character. Apart from the expected restaurants and shops, the main draw of the power plant was the four major, completely original attractions. First was the Laboratory of Wonders, a walkthrough attraction which explored how technology was improving people's lives around the world. Guests would start with a tour of Professor Flagg's lab, being greeted by the professor himself, before visiting the house of the future and an electric energy generator, which was powering a model of the Baltimore Harbor of the future. A nice little filler attraction, but nothing groundbreaking especially with the myriad of technical issues it constantly had. The other walkthrough style attraction in the park was the Circus of the Mysterious in the basement of the power plant. The attraction was home to Flagg's collection of mystical and magical artifacts, including Pandora's box, the Fountain of Youth, and a Leprechaun's Throne, with each item featuring an illusion or special effect, a lot of which were designed by the incredible company Technifex, in their first ever project. The next major attraction was the Magic Lantern Theatre, a show crammed full of 80 audio animatronic characters designed by the always amazing Mark Davis. The show was hosted by Mr. Electro, along with his younger assistant Proto, who provided the commentary and running narrative for the presentation. The show was like the American adventure at Epcot, with each act rising from below the floor to perform their part before lowering back down. Six Flags billed the performance as the most spectacular theatronic show in the world, with each act performing a musical number with tributes to Gilbert and Sullivan, Florence Ziegfeld, and more. The final attraction was the Sensorium, arguably the standout of the park. And even though the attraction itself isn't widely known, what it would do and introduce to the theme park industry was massive. The Sensorium was the world's first 4D theater, allowing guests for the first time to not only see the third dimension, but also feel, hear, and smell what was happening. The story followed Professor Flagg himself, wanting to create a time capsule of a simpler, slower paced time, where people could enjoy the world around them. The designers wanted the show to be a catch-all, featuring some thrills, some laughs, and some heart-touching moments. A 3D film timed with in-theater effects including vibrating chairs, scents, and water sprinklers was something completely new, and little did the creators know that it would create a whole new genre of rides, utilized by almost every major theme park since. And those four experiences were pretty much it for the park. A few carnival games and smaller things filled the gaps, but that was it. The power plant was obviously not trying to be a traditional Six Flags park, but there was really nothing about the product that screamed Six Flags at all. Whilst it was done to the best standard that could be achieved with the budget and restrictions placed by Six Flags, it was destined for failure before it had even opened, as the foundation that the project was built on wasn't stable and didn't even meet the basic rules of an entertainment facility in the theme park industry. The park would struggle almost immediately after opening, with a mostly lukewarm reception from guests expecting so much more and low visitor numbers. The long-term goal was to expand the Six Flags Urban Entertainment Center plans throughout the country in major cities, but the power plant's failure brought these plans to a halt. The Six Flags power plant would struggle through a few years of operation, closing in 1989. And although Six Flags would use the facility for the next year as a short-lived dance club called PT Flags, a year later in 1990, Six Flags would officially move out of the power plant building. The lead designer Gary Goddard said the park failed for a number of reasons, including the mismanaged marketing attempts of not an amusement park, a lack of quality control from the management team, the overall fact that walkthrough attractions are never great crowd pleasers, and above all, the biggest cause of failure was, of course, the lack of rides, the one thing Six Flags was renowned for. The ridiculousness of the whole no rides notion came to a head around a year after opening, 
when Gary Goddard got a letter from a new attorney working for Six Flags, so new that he had no idea about the history of the power plant. The letter stated that Six Flags was considering to sue Landmark Entertainment. And the reason? How could a design company ever create a theme park without any rides? Since the closure of the Six Flags power plant, the facility and surrounding area has still seen a lot of use. With tenants over the years including the first ESPN zone in America, the Hard Rock Cafe, Barnes & Noble, and more. Looking back on the project, it's easy to see why it failed, but it didn't need to. The creative minds assembled could have designed and built something truly remarkable, if only Six Flags had allowed them to. So whilst the industry has the Six Flags power plant to thank for introducing the concept of a 4D cinema, it's a shame the entire project isn't fondly remembered within the theme park community. A big thank you goes out to Josh at Theme Park University for letting me use his incredible series of articles and interviews detailing the power plant as the basis of this video. If you're interested in further reading, links are in the description. For review time, I'm Luke. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing.